The XXL freshman list has been bringing the best new talent that hip hop has to offer to the forefront for over 10 years now. We all know it, we've all seen it, we've all disagreed and discredited it from time to time. And when it was announced in March 2010, it was an interesting time for hip hop. These were the early stages of ignorant rap music. It was a simpler time, a time before every reference to an automobile was followed by the sound skrrr. Some people were upset by the inclusion of the poster boy for ignorant bars and funny sounding ad libs, OJ the Juice Man, while others were pissed off that there wasn't a single act from New York on the cover. These were the years when the East Coast, West Coast dichotomy was becoming a lot less important and a huge amount of attention in rap music was beginning to move to places like Atlanta. But with artists on the list like J. Cole coming out of North Carolina, Wiz Khalifa coming out of Pittsburgh, or Freddie Gibbs coming out of Gary, Indiana, there was plenty of regional diversity on the 2010 list. I'm still waiting on someone from Bognor Regis to make that list, maybe 2050. So like a fine vintage wine, the 2010 XXL freshman list was a very good year indeed. But before we get to the contents of the list, no XXL freshman cover is complete without some obligatory bitching about who was snubbed. When it comes to the XXL list, oftentimes a lot of people are more interested in who's not on the list. And 2010 saw some omissions of acts that people really wanted to see on that cover. First off, we've got Drizzy Drake. God, what happened to that guy? Well, it turns out Drake actually declined the offer of being on that cover, along with his YMCMB stepsis, no, not that kind of stepsis, Nicki Minaj. Well, their excuse was they both felt like they'd been snubbed in 2009 and that XXL had missed their opportunity to get them on the list when they were truly freshmen. Technically, we were freshmen when they didn't put us on. So um, I just feel like, you know, now it's, it's, it's just returning the favor. Which to be fair, does make sense. I mean, in 2009, Drake was riding high from his number two hit, Best I Ever Had, and probably did deserve a place on that list. I mean, let's be real, in 2010, Drake was getting the cover of GQ all by himself. Who really wants to go and stand around with nine other dudes at XXL? But then again, Nicki, on the other hand, was probably more suitable for a 2010 cover. Because in 2009, she was only three mixtapes deep, and she didn't end up signing with YMCMB until that summer of 2009. And looking back, if she'd have taken that 2010 slot, she might have actually got all the exposure that she needed to push her march 2010 single, Massive Attack, that ended up performing pretty poorly and getting dropped from her album. But hey, we can't take anything away from Nicki Minaj. She went on to have an amazing and illustrious career and she'll always be number two in my heart. But at the time, the other snob on that list was XV. Now I know what you're thinking, who the fuck is XV? Well, that's actually what I also thought at the time. But I remember reading one of his public tantrums bitching about how he didn't make the list and that led me to actually go and check out some of his music. And I gotta say, he was pretty good. He had a mixtape called Everybody's Nobody in 09 that picked up some buzz. And after getting snubbed, he went on a pretty Kanye-esque rant in a magazine, pointing out that he had songs with four other people on that list and that the only reason that he was overlooked was because of industry politics. But in spite of that snub, he did manage to sign to Warner Brothers and drop a series of pretty fire mixtapes. There was Zero Heroes, Popular Culture, and his track with Pusha T that was called Awesome is still pretty banging to this day. But where is he now? Well, it does not matter because he's not on the list. Because we're not here for the snubs or the dubs. We're here to find out who popped and who flopped on the Double XL 2010 freshman list, baby. D-Town, West Side, yeah, I said it, West Side. But they yelling big so much that you would thought it's best out. You and I are rocking with the newest, newest best out. Go on, roll that good up. I'll be honest with you, Big Sean, in my opinion, is extremely dull, but worthy of respect. I mean, think about it, he actually managed to get this far in his career whilst being incredibly dull. I mean, that's an achievement in itself. I mean, it's all well and good for someone like Kanye to reach the pinnacle of music, what with his incredible artistic talent, creativity, and originality. But for Big Sean, he's not over encumbered by pointless things like individuality, an interesting personality, or even a good name, which means that his tenacity to continue rapping for all of these decades, in spite of that, to the point where he had a credible career and a pretty impeccable collection of bangers in his catalogue is pretty impressive. Anywho, Sean's road to the freshman cover was littered with cliches. In 2005, after hearing Kanye would be at a local radio station doing an interview, Sean went down there to try and cash him outside. Now, more times, it's usually pointless trying to freestyle for somebody like Ye on the street. But in Sean's case, this is the exception that proves the rule. I remember I said something like, mm, make it feel good. Something about effing with me is a mistake like Big Smalls going to Cali. It's B-I-G with ferocious bars. I come hard every time like a porno star. I don't remember what else I said, but I just remember that one little part. 
And I'd just be like, oh man, I was just so not that good. Apparently Kanye quite liked Sean's not so good bars and inexplicably decided to sign him to his Good Music label. It was the 2007 mixtape, Finally Famous, that was released on Good Music that got Sean the buzz he needed. And I'd argue Big Sean has hardly had it tough in the rap game considering the fact that his first project was released under the banner of Kanye West's Good Music. I mean, how much of a head start can you hope for in the rap game? Note that Finally Famous was also the name of Big Sean's debut album in 2011, which just goes to show you who needs original ideas when you can rehash the first one that you ever had. But aligning with Kanye at the height of his popularity in 2008 turned out to be a good move for Sean, even landing him a feature in the style section of The Source in 2008. This feature saw Sean attempting to supplement his dull personality by covering his boring body with clothing from brands with much more character than him. Now, I would argue that Kanye has been doing the same thing, but then again, both of his personalities are more interesting than Big Sean's, no matter what they're wearing. Anyway, following his appearance on the freshman list and dropping finally famous in 2011, Big Sean's career went from strength to strength. And by 2019, he's racked up a catalogue of bangers that transcend his dull personality, including the hits My Last, Dance, I Don't F With You, and Bounce Back. Three out of four of his albums went platinum, and he's got over 30 platinum plaques from singles and features. In fact, while I was researching this video, I was genuinely astounded by the number of high-profile guest spots Big Sean has managed to bag throughout his career. Not bad for someone so monotonous, eh? And Sean also gets bonus career points for having survived dating Ariana Grande without getting his life ruined. Just in case you haven't put it together yourself, the majority of my hate for Big Sean is based on jealousy and bitterness. I mean, you can't win in hip hop at the level he has for this long and it be a fluke. I mean, the man is pure talent and jokes aside, he deserves his props. And boy, howdy, that illustrious career of his sure does pay off. In 2017, Big Sean had copped an 11,000 square foot mansion in Beverly Hills that he'd bought from the guitar player Slash. This place cost a cool $8.7 million. So if you know one thing, this freshman surely made it. Well, at least he's as boring as sin in an $8.7 million mansion with 30 platinum plaques. I did it without a track from Kanye, a beat from Dr. Dre, a hook from T-Pain, a co-sign from Jay, a 16 from Drake, a cameo from Snoop, a dance like Soldier Boy, you gotta salute. A healthy contrast to the runaway success of Big Sean's career is fellow 2010 freshman Fashion. The pure contempt that he has for his fellow freshmen is already apparent from the opening bars of his freestyle. This kind of represents the ignorant versus conscious rap debate in a nutshell. Many have suggested that Fashion was just selected to placate the real hip hop heads that were missing a true lyricist in that list. But unfortunately, Fashion turned out to be as much of a victim as the changing tide in hip hop as some of his more ignorant contemporaries. The West Coast rapper dropped his first mixtape Grizzly City in 2006, and he hustled mixtape after mixtape until 2009 when he dropped his debut album Boy Meets World that got a prestigious XL rating in XXL magazine itself. To me, it's very typical boom bap conscious rap. Not necessarily my cup of tea, but I gotta say the track Samsonite man does still hit me in the feels. And if you were anything like me, raised on a strict diet of mumble rap and ad-libs like skirt, this probably ain't gonna tickle your pickle either. But nonetheless, by the time he appeared in that freshman list, he had enough backpack wear and fans to sustain a credible career. He embarked on a handful of tours and dropped another mixtape, Higher Learning 2, which even had a couple of J. Cole beats on there. By 2012, he dropped his mixtape Champagne and Styrofoam Cups, which had fellow freshman and champagne guzzler Wiz Khalifa on it. Though looking at that front cover, perhaps the mixtape really should have been called Champagne styrofoam cups and a nasty case of crabs. By 2013, the tour game was strong as Fashion even shared the stage with Kendrick Lamar at Hip Hop Kent Festival. But seemingly he hit a career high in March of 2014 when he was bought out by Nas to the Mass Appeal Showcase at South by Southwest to a very unenthusiastic crowd. Austin, Texas makes a motherfucking noise. I can't hear you. This was followed by a high profile performance doing the ring walk at the Pacquiao Bradley fight. He then swiftly signed to Nas's Mass Appeal label and in 2015 dropped his second studio album, The Ecology, executive produced by Nas himself. This project frankly didn't get an encouraging amount of attention. The first single, Guess Who's Back, currently has around 320,000 views on YouTube today. That was followed by the single Higher, which hasn't quite cracked 100K, and the third single, Confess, still sits around 70K. Russ's editor here just to jump in and say that the 100 bars video also hit 100 Okay. Alongside the project, they dropped a mini documentary about Fashion that has some hard hitting content covering his tough come up in Fresno and some of his family struggles with drug misuse. But unfortunately, because of Fashion's slowing buzz, that also led to low view counts on his documentary. But don't get me wrong, low numbers doesn't necessarily mean the content's no good. His album was well reviewed and got an average of 84 out of 100 on Metacritic. And there's no doubt Fashion has his dedicated fans that are ready to ride for him. But for me, 
That old school kind of stuff just ain't really what I'm trying to hear right now. So it seems that the poor performance of this Nas-led second solo project didn't lead to a follow-up. In fact, Fashion hasn't dropped any solo projects since his 2017 Mana EP and the accompanying Mana music video, which has also seen dwindling numbers. Generally, his solo career has been pretty quiet since then, but you got to give him props. He has secured that bag by getting several lucrative placements of his song on video games. And while he is still officially listed as an artist on the Mass Appeal roster, the fact that they refer in his bio to his 2015 release, The Ecology, as a recent release makes me think that maybe he's not getting the attention he deserves over there. But then again, on the other hand, he did have a prominent slot alongside Nas on the song Apostles and two other tracks on the Mass Appeal label compilation, Starting Five. And we can assume that he was clearly getting a reasonable bag for participating in the Starting Five tour in 2019. And he's not been completely inactive. He's done the rounds in 2019, making press appearances, popping up to freestyle on Power 106, the LA Leakers, and as part of a Mass Appeal cipher on Sway in the Morning to promote that Starting Five album. So let's be real here. Fashion fell off from where he was in 2010 when he was on the freshman list. No disrespect to him. The scene moved on in some pretty unexpected ways from that point. But he made a great artistic catalog that really represented what he was all about. And I hope that he got the creative fulfillment that he he needed from those projects and that he's living his life surrounded by good people. And while Fashion never struck me as someone that was looking for the mainstream appeal, as we're going to see, many other people on this freshman list were able to keep up with the times and work the changing tide of the music industry in their favor. Smoking on some strong, got bitches who smoke bongs, papers and bowls, so pretty much anything goes. Okay, let's be real. Wiz is so A-list, he barely needs an introduction. But a lot of people don't realize just how much there is to the Wiz Khalifa story. Wiz was rapping and getting his green fingers into the music industry before he was even a teenager. He was only 16 when he got discovered by Rostrum Records, the same label that actually signed Mac Miller. He signed a deal with them and worked his way up to his first studio album, Show and Proof, landing him the title of One to Watch by Rolling Stone magazine. Off the back of that release, Wiz signed a deal with Warner Brothers and released his first commercial single, Say Yeah, which didn't hit the full-blown Billboard Hot 100, but did manage to land placements on the rap, pop, rhythmic, and bubbling under charts. But despite dropping a handful of heavy mixtapes, including the classic Flight School, Wiz started getting frustrated with his deal at Warner Brothers. Tired of constant delays to his next album, he managed to get out of his deal. And once he was out, he dropped the ironically titled album Deal or No Deal, which did end up on a couple of rap charts. And it was off the back of that that he landed his spot on the XXL 2010 freshman list, as well as being named the Source's Rookie of the Year. That put him up there with other recipients of prestigious Source Awards, such as Labrooks, who won Bookie of the Year, Ben, who won Cookies of the Year, and Chewbacca, who won Wookie of the Year. He followed that up with a fire mixtape, Cushion Orange Juice, which to this day still has a couple of my favorite Wiz tracks of all time on it. The Kid Frankie, Still Blazing, Never Been, that thing is worth checking out to this day. That project actually went on to trend on Twitter, and a lot of people realized around this time that Wiz had true star quality. But it was after signing with Atlantic in September of 2010 that he dropped the song Black and Yellow, and shit blew up. This song was huge, with Wiz famously shouting out the colors of the Pittsburgh Steelers, his home team, the same colors that he had painted on his Dodge Challenger. But this was a slow burner, and the track actually only debuted at number 100 on the Billboard charts, before falling off the charts completely and taking another 18 weeks before it would hit number one, eventually going on to go six times platinum. But a lot of people around this time thought Wiz was going to be a one-hit wonder. And I mean, any rapper that just gets one massive hit that's beyond anything in their catalog is always going to be scared of that happening. But still, his album Rolling Papers did hit number two on the charts. His other singles, Roll Up, On My Level, No Sleep, and The Race, all bagged positions on the Billboard charts. And by the time the press run for this album was over, all eyes were on Wiz and what his next move would be. And to be fair, he came with a fire. He dropped his next album, ONIFC, which included the incredible hit Work Hard, Play Hard, as well as a diabolical pair of pants on the front cover. That hit number two on the Billboard chart, and he managed to take that number two without throwing a tantrum like Nicki Minaj. But what we're not going to do is have this auto tool man coming up here selling fucking sweaters and telling y'all he sold half a million fucking albums because he didn't. And he followed that one up with the album Black Hollywood that hit number one on the album charts and had the smash single Weed and Boys. But to be fair, the album did get middling reviews. But it was in 2015 that the unthinkable would happen. Wiz was commissioned to make a song for the soundtrack to the seventh Fast and Furious film. Seven Fast, Seven Furious, if you will. Now this song was always bound to do well because it was a tribute to Paul Walker who had tragically passed away in a car accident that same year before completing the film. And that beautiful tribute song See You Again ended up being number one for 12 weeks on the trot, tying it with Eminem's Lose Yourself for the longest running rap number one until Lil Nas X would come along and embarrass everyone. This song was streamed billions of times and even for a period it held the title of the most viewed video on YouTube. And on top of that, it was the best selling song worldwide for 2015. You don't get much better than that, Wiz. I mean, just imagine that for a second. You have this enormous monster hit, Black and Yellow, that absolutely blows up 
So big that you spend the next four years of your career living in its shadow, desperately trying to have another hit that gets even close to it. And then bam, biggest song in the world ever completely smashes Black and Yellow. But many people, even now, are still skeptical of Wiz Khalifa's longevity. Even when you're at the top, the haters are gonna hate, and I'm gonna hate too. So all I'll say to Wiz Khalifa is this. There ain't no way you can do that a third time. You're nothing but a two-hit wonder. Two hits, too furious. Couple months ago, couldn't imagine this at all. Now you're hanging with a star like SpongeBob, Patrick. Everything I do is so coke, classic. Now, Donis was probably the most unknown selection on the list at the time. Despite having a decent catalog of music out, he didn't necessarily have quite the same buzz as some of the other artists on the list. In fact, he'd just signed to Atlantic Records and a lot of people were speculating at the time that his double XL placement may have been the result of some industry string pulling. But industry plant allegations aside, Donis actually has one of the most interesting stories of anyone that's even been on this list. He joined the Air Force in high school and actually spent several years working on an army base in Tokyo where he spent his spare time writing and recording music. But after two and a half years, he left to pursue his rap career. And it didn't take him long to get discovered by 8-Track and sign a deal with indie label Fool's Gold. And his 2009 release, Diary of an ATL Brave, caught a big industry buzz. His biggest song on there was called Gone, and honestly, it's a certified banger that still goes hard today. And you may recognize that track from having been famously remixed by Lil Wayne on his leaked track, 30 Minutes to New Orleans. So that big tape and that big single landed him his deal, which subsequently got him onto the XXL freshman list. That was really crazy time for me. Fresh out of the military to just working on on your first mixtape and your first mixtape taking you to to cover a double XL. It's a, it's a super, super fast process. From there, he continued on his mixtape hustle with releases like The Invitation, Fashionably Late, and Southern Lights. But by 2012, things seemed to be kind of slowing down for Donitz. In June, he dropped the song Hello Kitty that did reasonably well, but a lot of people pulled it out for its uninspired lyrics and basic concept. But he kept hustling, going on to appear on Sway's Five Fingers of Death, and dropping his Break Hundreds and Hearts EP in August. He went on to drop the song absolutely from that project as a single, and whilst in my opinion it was a really solid song, it just seemed to go down like a lead balloon, still only having 40,000 views on YouTube today, seven years later. And then from there, Donis basically just disappeared. He fell out of the music industry for the next five years. He eventually did resurface in 2017 with a new track called Touch that was very different from his previous work. And he did actually do a little bit of press around that time to explain his five year absence. He said that by the end of 2012, he felt felt empty and unsatisfied with the music industry. So he moved to San Francisco to drop acid and study Buddhism before spending some more time trying to find himself in Hawaii and LA before returning home to Atlanta. Unfortunately, the musical rebirth that he was looking for from his song Touch didn't really pan out. The song failed to get any significant buzz and still to this day, it's sitting around 2000 views on YouTube. So it seems after the failure for the song Touch to take off, his planned project, A Sunny Place for Shady People failed to materialize and he was out of the shady rap game for good. So where is Donis today? Well, he does have a Twitter that lists him of Director of Influencer Marketing at Grailed, the online swag marketplace. And to be fair, it seems over there he's been on his mogul shit and has been working, putting together some pretty cool campaigns, working with artists like GEZ and even another collaboration with Future. So at the end of the day, Donis didn't make it in the rap game quite how he wanted to. But it seems like today he's still doing his thing, getting it in if it's in a slightly different niche and living his best life. In my opinion, you've got to admire anybody that can take an L, evolve and move on to the next thing without letting the shady rap game get them down. So. Donis, I salute and thank you for the good music. Hey, I'm slick as a pickpocket or blast like a rocketeer. Zero traffic lights, my dog, no stopping here. In 2009, Pill's music video for his song Trap Going Ham blew up for all the wrong reasons, specifically because it had footage of real junkies tooting rocks in it. The video caused a real stir at the time with many people outraged at the exploitation of what seemed like down and out drug users. But on the other hand, many people loved the gritty reality as well as just the pure balls to make a music video that literally shows you serving the J's on your block. And and to be fair to Peel, he contrasted the blatant ignorance of Trap Going Ham with the more introspective song Glass. Peel actually started off his career as a protege of Killer Mike, appearing on his underground Atlanta compilation on the tracks Bunkin and Grind Time. Peel rose through the ranks of hip hop fast, getting featured in the source's unsigned hype column, as well as getting a shout out from Andre 3000 for his mixtape 4180 The Prescription. This took him to his placement in the XXL freshman list in 2010, and he followed that up with the Gangster Grills mixtape 1140 The Overdose, hosted by legend legendary label boss DJ Drama. Oh sorry, I mean DJ Drama! And Pill supposedly signed a major label deal around this time. Now it's not exactly clear what this entailed, but it seemed like Pill had signed his own deal with Warner Brothers, who at the same time had just signed a joint venture with m m m m Maybach Music. 
So Pill ended up appearing prominently on around seven tracks of the first Triple M label compilation, Self Made Volume 1. And a lot of people had high hopes around this time that Pill would be joining Maybach Music and dropping a project that was to the double MG standard. But Rick Ross actually later revealed it was Warner Brothers that had pushed Pill his way because they felt he needed help getting a buzz. Apparently Ross said he only had a year's worth of goodwill for Pill and that had eventually run its course. Pill then left Warner Brothers abruptly in 2012 without explanation, going on to drop his The Epidemic mixtape, which was well received but didn't really take him to the next level. Seemingly, issues with record labels begun to get in the way of him dropping his debut project, Over the Counter Drugs, and just in general, he began to drop music less frequently. And then around 2014, again, he just dropped off the map and stopped dropping music completely. And he did this with no explanation. No big announcement, no retirement tweets, nothing. Apparently, some journalists at DJ Booth did discover that he had spent a little bit of time in jail sometime between 2013 and 2015. He then returned in 2018 with the song Backright, which frankly performed pretty badly, sitting around 2,000 YouTube views to this day. Now for the record, I really wanted to make effort in this video not to kick people while they're down or roast guys that didn't really get the careers that they felt they deserved. But frankly, Pill's comeback song just wasn't that good. Like bro, you've literally been missing for four years, no explanation, and you bring this comeback song and not a single bar of it explains your absence. Not a word on where you've been, what you've been going through, why you haven't been giving the fans music. Just generic bars about money, your haters, and how you're gonna smash my bitch. Why does every rapper wanna smash my bitch? I don't even have a bitch. I shouldn't call people bitches, it's not nice. And even all of the pieces of PR that he managed to get around this song at the time had absolutely no explanation of his absence. And that is literally the last we ever heard of Pill. And it's a real shame, you know, because maybe there's a good reason that he fell off the map. But when you spend all of these years trying to get fans behind you, get people to support your music, and you just disappear without giving them any explanation, you kind of owe it to the fans that were excited about you to at least give them some understanding as to where you went. But hey, it's highly possible that Pill could have suffered some kind of terrible hardship through these years. And if he did, hey, I'm sorry for that. But fans love a story. And that comeback song was a big opportunity for him to at least tell the story and let us understand why he hadn't been here and let people get behind him and support him again. But unfortunately, he failed at that and it was a big opportunity missed. Dream like you never seen obstacles, chasing obscene profits so we ain't stopping for the red lights. J. Cole. J. Cole, J. Cole, J. Cole. He's doing pretty well for himself. Next! I'm a liberal disease infested MC. No really, no really. Obviously, I could spend hours talking about J. Cole, but that's what 15-year-old girls do. Look, I'll let you in on a little secret. I actually have a lot of ideas for J. Cole-related stories and J. Cole-related lore that I'm definitely going to be working on on this channel over the next few months. So I don't want to give the game away. So let's just stick to the numbers and see how hard this guy fell off since he was a freshman in 2010. J. Cole first started making waves in 2007 with his mixtape The Come Up, its follow-up The Warm Up, and the follow-up to that which I just made up, The Shut Up. Shut up J. Cole, I'm tired of these sad songs. It was actually the warm-up that featured the huge breakout track Lights Please. This actually caught the attention of Jay-Z before the mixtape had even released. He promptly signed him to Rock Nation and gave him a high-profile guest spot on his album The Blueprint 3 on the song A Star Is Born. Now if getting signed by Jay-Z and debuting on a song on his album that was produced by Kanye West isn't a big enough co-sign to give you a start in the rap game, I don't know what is. I mean the only person that could blow an opportunity this good is Space Ghost Perp. And no more rants, please, Perp. Let me talk about some white pussy motherfucker named Trap Lore. I really beat your ass, bro. Watch your mouth for real. Like, don't talk to me. I'm not no kid, bro. I'm 28 years old. Like, I really beat your ass. So at this point, J. Cole's inclusion on the XXL 2010 freshman list is hardly surprising. And getting a co-sign from Jay-Z is pretty much gold dust in the rap game, despite what some of the more bitter freshmen might say. I did it without a track from Kanye, a beat from Dr. Dre, a hook from T-Pain, a co-sign from Jay. From there, his career went from strength to strength. His debut album, Cold World, The Sideline Story, dropped in 2011. And after a solid year of working with the likes of Drake, Kanye, and Kendrick Lamar, fans were itching for J. Cole's album like Tweaking Fiends in the Trap Going Ham video. That album dropped at number one on Billboard, selling 218,000 units in its first week and going gold within months. He took his time touring and crafting the perfect follow-up Born Sinner, which he actually dropped on the same day as Kanye West's Yeezus in 2013. He sold 297,000 units, coming in only 30,000 copies short of Kanye's Yeezus. That's funny, coming after Kanye is usually Wiz Khalifa's job. A year later, he was dropping 2014 Forest Hill Drive, which had the huge single Wet Dream and No Role Model, shifting 353,000 copies first week and hitting number one. And this will be the first time that J. Cole would famously go platinum with no features. Not a single guest appearance in sight, a feat that very few rappers can pull off these days. I mean, I doubt DJ Khaled could go plastic without any features. This even landed him a Grammy nomination in 2015 for Best Rap Album, Top Rap Album at the 2015 Billboard Music Awards, and Album of the Year at the BET Hip Hop Awards. But Cole was not satisfied with this being the pinnacle 
pinnacle of his career. By 2016, he was dropping for your eyes only, hitting number one once again and moving 492,000 units. And impressively, getting all 10 of the tracks to slide into the Billboard Top 40. So surely at this point, J. Cole's tired of winning. Nope, 2018, Cole announces a surprise event for fans in New York City, which turned out to be a listening session for his surprise album, K.O.D., that dropped at the end of that week. And these ravenous fans were there ready to slurp up tracks harder than Lil Wayne slurping up an ice cold McDonald's milkshake that's topped up with lean. K.O.D., that was another number one, 397,000 units, and three individual songs in the top 10 charts. Honestly, this barely touches the iceberg when it comes to J. Cole's prolific artistry. Sure, when it comes to individual hit songs, he's not necessarily had something that's hit the levels that Wiz Khalifa had on Black and Yellow or See You Again. But anytime Cole drops an album, people listen and people pick it up. Even his Dreamville record label compilations tear through the charts with his most recent one, Revenge of the Dreamers 3, coming in at number one too. Honestly, it's kind of hard to even mock J. Cole because he's gotten this far with all of his artistic integrity intact. I just don't think there's any way J. Cole is gonna fall off. Because J. Cole's fame and following is so deeply entrenched with the people that listen to his music and love his artistry, as opposed to that fake, artificial following that record labels are often able to cultivate for less good artists. So, J. Cole is going nowhere, people. He did it big, and he did it the right way. So, if you're a rapper, and you're ever in doubt of your career, your relevancy, or if you're making the right decisions artistically, just ask yourself, what would J. Cole do? I'm a lyrical disease infested MC. Bring your best three, I eat them like Nookie and give them hysterectomies. It's fitting that J-Rock would say that he has a lyrical disease, because he's basically the opposite of Pill. The TDE boy who managed to be a double XL freshman before Kendrick Lamar, but then would spend years of his career living in Kendrick's shadow, but eventually coming through with a catalog of hits that would cement his rightful place as a legendary rap artist in his own right. It's hard to talk about J-Rock or Kendrick without bringing up Top Dog, aka Anthony Tiffith, the CEO and founder of Top Dog Entertainment. When Top Dog found J-Rock, he was living a double life, on the one side rapping, on the other side rolling with the bounty hunt of bloods in LA. I assume they weren't a gang just dedicated to getting their hands on unwanted coconut-based Christmas chocolates. After hearing a verse of his, Top Dog signed J-Rock to TDE and supported him releasing several mixtapes, including the criminally underrated No Sleep Till NYC with Kendrick Lamar. Him and Top Dog landed a deal with Asylum Records and a joint venture with Warner Brothers back in 2007, and J-Rock released his big debut single All My Life with Lil Wayne and Will I Am in 2008. This was a major label release backed by Warner Brothers and did pretty well for J-Rock. And interestingly, when that song leaked, it had a little known rapper known as K-Dot on the hook. That hit number 10 on the Billboard bubbling under chart and was well received by the fans. This was his first major label release with Warner Brothers and it didn't really go as well as planned. And it probably didn't get as big as he'd hoped. It only hit number 10 on the Billboard bubbling under charts, below the official main charts, but it was well received by the fans. And from there, the official label releases with J-Rock were pretty intermittent. The music video for All My Life didn't drop till a year later, and that song was still getting official remixes in 2010. Talk about flogging a dead horse. But J-Rock wasn't getting complacent and he hustled his mixtapes hard, dropping Coming Soon to a Hood Near You, Volume 1 and 2, and Gutter Music. Those landed him his 2010 freshman slot, and he followed that up with the appropriately titled From Hood Tales to the Cover of Double XL. After that release and spending some time touring with 50 Cent, he left Warner Brothers after being frustrated with delays in putting out his real album. So finally a free man, he got back to dropping big music, busting out his Black Friday mixtape and the big single Hood Gone Love It with Kendrick Lamar that actually ended up getting featured in the soundtrack and in the trailer to Grand Theft Auto V. And his debut album that included Hood Gone Love It and that three-year-old single All My Life finally dropped in 2011. That album, Follow Me Home, was fairly well reviewed but it didn't necessarily chart that well, landing at number 83 on Billboard and moving only around 5,000 copies in the first week. But the fans loved it and they kept riding for J-Rock. So he went on to spend 2012 touring with Absol, Kendrick Lamar and Schoolboy Q in their collective known as Black Hippie. And he also had a high profile feature on Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid Mad City album on the absolute banger Money Trees, dropping a show stealing verse that he would go on to perform at the 2013 BET Awards with Kendrick Lamar. And that same year he announced on Power 105 that he would be dropping a new album. That ended up being 90059, named after his postal code in Watts. But unfortunately, things would remain pretty quiet from J-Rock until 2015, and he blamed that lack of musical output on the music industry and politics. Man, I wish I was a rapper so I could blame all my problems on the music business too. And DJ Drama, I wanna blame DJ Drama as well. But mid-2015, he finally got a chance to drop that album and the single Pay For It, which he got a chance to perform on Saturday Night Live alongside Kendrick Lamar, who was performing his new single, I. That was followed up by Money Tree's Deuce, which was a follow-up to that original song that was from Kendrick's album. And J-Rock's second effort performed a lot better than his first. It was critically acclaimed, even if it did didn't necessarily reach the same height of sales that Kendrick Lamar's musical output was at the time. It landed at number 16 on the Billboard, selling over 18,000 copies in its first week. Unfortunately, his career would suffer another setback in 2016 when he was involved in a pretty nasty motorcycle accident. So 2016 and 2017 were also pretty quiet for J-Rock, though he did get 
get by and remain in people's minds, nabbing a couple of high profile guest spots for the likes of E40 in the game. But never one to fall off easy, in 2018, J Rock came back with a power move. The song King's Dead with Kendrick Lamar and Future, in my opinion, is the best work of his career. The accompanying music video, which featured stylistic cues from the Wolf of Wall Street and the amazing beat produced by Mike Will, just made anybody who heard or saw it instantly fall in love with the tune. I mean, look at this video. The dude is rapping in a palm tree. Wiz Khalifa and J. Cole don't rap in palm trees, do they? I don't see him doing that. Am I wrong? That track landed a deserved spot on the Billboard charts at number 21, went double platinum and charted on 10 different charts around the world. The track won best rap performance at the Grammys. What can I say, man? You know what I mean? I want to thank God first. You already know, first and foremost, I want to thank my team. Top dog entertainment, man. I don't, I don't even know what to say, man. You already know, man. And it also got a high profile placement on the Black Panther soundtrack, which you know got J Rock a tidy bag. That track was actually a lead in to J Rock's third album, Redemption, which had a pretty good performance on the Billboard charts, coming in at number 13 and selling around 31,000 units in its first week. Jumping in again, Ross forgot to mention J Rock's huge banger win from the Redemption album, which he performed at the Grammys and got a nomination for Best Song. It hasn't been an easy or straight road for J Rock to get where he is today. And it looks like he's had countless opportunities to fall off the map completely or quit the rap game. But it seems that he does have good people around him and he is truly committed to his art. And while he clearly didn't get the same commercial or financial recognition that Kendrick did, he carved out a very unique position for himself since getting that double XL placement and picking up a couple of Grammys and platinum plaques along the way. So big ups J-Rock. Deals made dollar for dollar, gram for gram. You can follow me and see just how much a man can stand before we go off the deep end. Come to your crib and creep in. Freddie Gibbs has had a tumultuous relationship relationship with the record industry. He says that he was selling drugs out of a friend's recording studio and only picked up the mic after realizing that he could rap better than everyone that came through the door. He'd been rapping since 2004 and dropped two volumes of a mixtape series called Full Metal Jacket. And off the buzz of this mixtape hustle, Freddie was able to move from Gary, Indiana to Los Angeles where he signed a deal with Interscope Records. At Interscope, he was working on his debut album, but unfortunately the man that signed him, Joe Weinberger, left Interscope soon after and Freddie's album ended up getting shelved and Freddie ended up getting dropped. But now Never one to give up, Freddie got back on that independent mixtape hustle and dropped two volumes of a new mixtape series called Life from Gary, Indiana and several others. Leading up to 2009 when he finally dropped the miseducation of Freddie Gibbs featuring the big single from the G. That album was critically acclaimed on the internet and he followed that up with the classic Midwest gangster box frame Cadillac music. As well as being the title of his album, that's also actually the competition winning word in the annual Blue Ivy Hip Hop Spelling Bee. This led to a feature being written about him in the New Yorker magazine where he was hailed as the only rapper to put money on. And I think that's in a betting sense, not in a 6 9 sense. I got 30 pack right now, bro. 30 pack. He followed Midwest gangster box frame Cadillac music with the inexplicably long album The Label's Trying to Kill Me, which featured a whopping 82 tracks and a hilarious promotional infomercial. I'm Fred Gibbs, and I would like to bring. We will do a lot. This album you can expect a lot of gun toting, fish smacking, and hoe bashing. Maybe that's what I needed for my album to pop. And that placement, along with a handful of high-performing mixtapes and EPs, managed to catch the attention of legendary record label Decon, who helped Freddie distribute his new project, Straight Killer. That would actually land him a spot on the R&B and hip-hop charts at number 48, which isn't bad for somebody that's so strictly gangster. And off the back of that, Jeezy signed a deal proper with Young Jeezy's CTE record label. And that's CTE for Corporate Thugs Entertainment, not the similarly titled football head injury. At CTE, he dropped multiple projects, including Lord Giveth, Lord Taketh Away, A Cold Day in Hell, and the critically acclaimed DJ Drama, Gangsta Grill's mixtape, Babyface Killer. But by the end of 2012, he'd be announcing his departure from CTE. Apparently, there was no real bad blood between Jeezy and Freddie, but Freddie said that they just move in different ways. And it seems highly possible that maybe Freddie just wasn't feeling being signed underneath another rapper, and that his personality was too big to not be going on it his own and being the boss of his own destiny. So he got to launching his own label, ESGN, evil seeds grow naturally. Getting a distribution deal with Empire and dropping a debut album of the same name. He supposedly was inspired by having toured with independent legend and goatee connoisseur Tech 9 seeing just how far you could go remaining independently underground in hip-hop. ESGN fared well in the rap charts, coming in at number 17, and by 2014, Freddie was getting deeper into the underground, doing a collaboration album with Mad Lib, not to be confused with the word game Mad Lib, or rabid Hillary Clinton supporters Mad Libs. At the time, that piñata project ended up being Freddie's most successful project to date, coming in at number 13. 39 on the actual Billboard album charts and moving 9,000 copies in its first week. Not bad for something that's so
so darn niche. And to be fair, if those sales numbers aren't really impressing you, Freddie says that he became a millionaire just off that project on an independent tip. He followed that up with a very strong 2015, including linking up with legendary British hip hop producer The Purist for the song Pimp Hand on his compilation album, Pyrex Scholar, which in my opinion features probably the best artwork for a hip hop vinyl in history, including a handy insert guide on exactly how to cook crack. Shout out The Purist and Dope Records one time. As well as that, he also dropped the album Shadow of Doubt, but unfortunately, 2016 wouldn't end up being such a good year for Freddie. There'd been a dark spot on Freddie's reputation for several years due to an unfortunate charge that he'd caught whilst in Europe. This was really a tough time for Freddie and he actually ended up in jail for a few weeks. Unfortunately, as is common with the media these days, the accusation itself gets a whole lot of attention, but a lot of people miss the news of his complete acquittal at the end of 2016. But catching a charge in Europe nowadays does seem like a rite of passage for any legendary rapper. So after clearing his name and getting uncancelled, Freddie kept the music coming in 2017, dropping the album You Only Live Twice, which featured no features on a J. Cole tip. That album was fairly well reviewed and gave Freddie his artistic redemption after beating those charges in 2016. But while well received by the fans, it only hit number 124 on the Billboard chart. And his Teddy Pendergrass inspired follow-up, Freddie, was again positively reviewed by fans and critics, but only landed at 142 on the Billboard chart. But then again, it did manage to also nab number 16 on the UK Independent Albums chart, and at least it included another hilarious promotional infomercial with a bit more of a vintage feel, as well as a mini documentary presented by Fact Magazine. But here we are in 2019 and Freddie Gibbs is still not letting up. He just dropped another collaborative album with Mad Lib called Bandana, which to be fair has outdone nearly everything Freddie has done up to this point, hitting number 21 on the Billboard Albums charts, as well as landing on over 10 different international album charts worldwide. So there it is, Freddie has had some ups and downs in his career, but he's stayed relevant to the underground and firmly remains in the game. He's doing his thing in a lane that works for him. And let's not forget the fact that he's been doing it all independently since he left CTE means that even if he's not always top in charts, he's definitely securing a tidy little bag for himself. See it rains on like a basketball player. Freshman of the year like a basketball player. Right, this is the one I was probably the most looking forward to. Let's just say off the bat, I am a huge Juice Man fan. I remember discovering him as a teenager around the time I discovered Gucci Mane and I just couldn't get enough of the guy's ad libs. Hey, hey, okay, okay. Hey! OJ the Juice Man grew up in Atlanta and lived in the same hood as Gucci Mane. They were both part of a group called the Never Again Family, who in 2004 dropped the big song My Black Tea, which featured Gucci Mane on the hook and the verse, and OJ even popped up in the video. That's some vintage trap lore right there. But Juice says he was rapping as early as 1999. But around the time Gucci Mane had set up and was seeing some success with his So Icy ENT, OJ the Juice Man followed suit and set up his own record label, 32 ENT. So Juice got to hustling and started dropping tapes like On The Come Up, Hood Classics Extra, and Juice World paving the way for him getting a DJ drama gangster grills in the form of culinary art school in 2008. And it was that same year that Juice managed to get some major label attention, signing a deal with Asylum Records and dropping his debut album, The Other Side of That Trap. This album featured a couple of my personal favorite bangers from over the years, including I'm getting money. And of course, Make the Trap Say Hey, which featured Gucci Mane and even a very sly video cameo from a young Nicki Minaj. Now that album wasn't a huge commercial success. It hit number nine on the rap album charts and Make the Trap Say a hit number 13 on the hip hop songs charts. But he kept building his buzz right through 2009 and 2010 with classic mixtapes like Alaska in Atlanta and Six Rings. But it wasn't all good for Juice on his come up. In April 2009, he was shot eight times in a robbery. Fortunately, the gunshots were only below the waist and he was out of hospital within days and performing on stage on crutches by the end of the week. But his tenacity and hustle would pay off, landing him that prestigious slot on the 2010 XXL freshman list. And boy howdy had he worked to get there, saying in his magazine interview that by the time he was on that cover, he was around 31 mixtapes deep. That's some borderline Viper shit right there. However, OJ's placement on the cover was pretty controversial in hip hop at the time because the culture hadn't quite transitioned yet all the way to just being mindless background music that you put on while you're fighting your way out of a Xanax psychosis or X hole as I like to call it. At the time, OJ's simple trap rhymes, seemingly obnoxious ad libs and basic flows ruffled a lot of feathers amongst the hip hop purists. Many were outraged that such a non-lyrical rapper could even be on the list. Hell, I mean, his freshman freestyle is basically just four bars rhyming the same word over and over again. See, it rains on like a basketball player. Freshman of the year like a basketball player. Where the do good, man, I'm here to stay. Oh, man, come, man, we in your fade. Hey. So Gucci's homeboy Juice Man was another victim of the turning tide in hip hop. Juice was famously booed off stage in New York. Get some fucking noise for OJ the Juice Man! and 
and subsequently clowned on the viral trap parody banger, Shout the Shout It. But in spite of these embarrassing incidents, Juice kept his momentum going on in the South, even if he was looked down upon by the New York scene. He relentlessly dropped more mixtapes than I can even name in the coming years, including Lord of the Rings and Culinary Art School 2. But unfortunately, Juice Man and Gucci fell out for a long period, which I won't really get into here, but that could be another video if you want it. And his second studio album was delayed for many years until 2014, by which point his buzz had really died down a lot. Eventually, he did manage to drop that second album on his own label at the end of 2014, the Otis Williams Jr. story, but that failed to make any dents on the charts. But even whilst the mainstream interest in OJ the Juice Man died down, he continued to relentlessly drop mixtapes through 2014, 15, 16, and 17. Though by 2018, his momentum had slowed down and he'd only released one mixtape that year, The Trap Boss. And again in 2019, only one mixtape so far, Six Rings Four. Listen, OJ was never gonna be a huge commercial mainstream rapper. And while he did manage to bag a few high profile guest appearances for the likes of Two Chains, Chief Keef, and even bizarrely R. Kelly, he was always meant to be a trapper's rapper. But if you're like me and you love the most ignorant Atlanta trap music that you can find, because it's just fun, it's just lit, and you can just let loose and be yourself, then Juice is your man. And even though he didn't necessarily get all of the props and recognition that he deserved, you'd be lying if you said OJ's eccentric style and unusual ad libs hadn't influenced an entire generation of new rappers, like the Migos, Young Thug, and Gucci Mane himself. And even though Juice isn't necessarily a household name, he is very embedded in the culture. I mean, his track No Hook is quite literally the first thing you hear when you put on Donald Glover's Atlanta. And that's because love him or hate him, OJ the Juice Man is as Atlanta as it gets. Look, I never take a break. Even when I'm hoarse, I was married to the streets and for this bitch I got divorced. So why just go hard and let nature take its course? Nipsey Hussle's first mixtape, Slawson Boy, dropped in 2005 and started getting him a buzz around the LA rap scene. He hustled away for a few years until he caught the attention of Cinematic Music Group who signed him in a deal with Epic Records. And they supported the release of his mixtape series, Bullets Ain't Got No Name, volume one through three. The success of this series caught the attention of big names in the industry and by 2009, he was collaborating with fellow crip hop legend Snoop Dogg and British grime artist Drake. But unfortunately for Nipsey, the mainstream charts weren't feeling his music as much as the streets were. This coincided with his label going through some tough financial times and Nipsey saw the opportunity to go back to being independent and seize hold of it. But the timing for going independent seemed to be perfect for Nipsey, bagging that slot on the XXL 2010 freshman list, giving him huge exposure and a platform to then go and be a free agent and secure that bag for himself. XXL called him the most determined of his class in 2010 and they weren't wrong. Unlike several of his fellow freshmen that felt dejected and demotivated after falling out with their record labels, Nipsey continued continued to hustle and motivate independently through the 2010s. He started his own label, All Money In, and begun to drop his legendary mixtape series, The Marathon, followed by the sequel, The Marathon Continues, and the third sequel, which I just made up, Please for the love of God, can you let this marathon stop my feet hurt? Gotta keep it light. But honestly, the first time I really stood up and took notice of Nipsey's business brain was in 2013 when he released his mixtape, Crenshaw. He revealed that only 1,000 physical copies of this CD would be made, and they would each be getting sold for $100 a piece. And turns out, Jay-Z bought 100 copies. Presumably to bundle with one of his other projects nobody wants to buy. But just like that, Nipsey managed to sell all 1,000 copies of his album in 24 hours for $100 a piece, netting a cool 100 grand. This was frankly a genius finesse, which arguably he may have taken a little too far with his 2014 release Mailbox Money, where he only pressed up 100 copies, selling those for $1,000 each. A genius move, which once again I'm probably going to steal to try and stimulate sales for my flopping album Viper the Piper. I'm proud to announce today that I'll only be making a very limited batch of one physical copy of the CD with front and back covers printed by my desk jet printer and the disc burned onto a CDR. So you can grab a piece of hip hop history yourself right now in my merch store for the cool price of 100 grand. Jay-Z, I hope you're watching and I'd just like to say I'm sorry for all of the elevator punching bag jibes. Anywho, after a decade of relentless mixtape hustling, it was in 2018 that Nipsey would finally release to the world his debut studio album, Victory Lap. And boy, was it worth the wait. Now it's pretty unlikely that you even watch my channel and you haven't given Nipsey's victory lap a listen, but if you haven't, it is absolutely essential. It's laced with bangers from start to finish and it really got Nipsey the recognition that he deserved. It hit number two on the Billboard charts and sold over 50,000 units off the bat. Damn, think how much money he'd have made if he'd have been selling those for $100 a piece. He even got a nomination for best rap album at the 61st Grammy Awards. And even though he'd hit the pinnacle of his music career in 2018, he was still quietly making big moves behind the scenes, helping his community through activism and entrepreneurship. Funding improvements in local schools, setting up community workspaces to help entrepreneurs in his area, and brokering 
meetings with the LAPD to try and work out how they could solve and reduce gang violence in LA. But unfortunately, as we all know, Nipsey was taken from us in 2019, well before his time. But his legacy lives on, and even if he wasn't the best selling or best charting freshman in the list, he without a doubt had one of the biggest impacts on music and on his community. And I feel like Nipsey's a really good place to end. It's been nine years since the XXL 2010 freshman list, and for some rappers, that was the pinnacle of their career. But for others, it was just the beginning of the journey to the top. Being a chart-topping megastar in hip-hop might be the destiny for some, but for others, they gave it a go and found out that that career path just wasn't for them. And hell, even now, I'm discovering how different reality can be from your expectations when it comes to going for a career in entertainment. Hey, there was a time when I truly wanted to be the next Wiz Khalifa, but I know now I probably couldn't handle or wouldn't enjoy being Wiz. I don't know if Pill could handle being Wiz Khalifa. I don't know if Big Sean could handle being J. Cole. Now, I don't know any of these freshmen personally, but what I really hope is that no matter how their careers turned out, they became the best versions of themselves, that they made the art they wanted to make, and they learned what they needed to learn from the opportunity that that freshman cover gave to them. Because hey, life comes at you fast, and you gotta try and live your best life. Maybe Donis didn't expect to become who he became today, and maybe Big Sean didn't expect to become who he became today, and I didn't necessarily know who I was gonna become. But hey, maybe one day, one of these rappers on the 2019 freshman list will leave the rap game behind, put down the mic, pick up a Canon 5D, and become the next Trap Lord Ross. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, make sure that you like and subscribe below. I've just launched some of my new merch collection, so if you wanna go and check some of that out, go to traplaw.com or hit the link down in the description. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, peace out.